a lot of new developers I work with think of their code from the perspective of only two parties. First is themselves, because they obviously write the code. And second, the users of the product they're building, their customers. However, if you want to become a better developer, you have to add one more stakeholder to your code other developers who will reuse your code to build a product that may be entirely different from what you are trying to build. There are many design patterns and refactoring approaches you can take to improve your code with respect to reusability, but there's one simple rule that you can follow which will help you identify a lot of bad patterns in your code and act as a starting point to better code design. That simple rule is to avoid hidden dependencies by using explicit contracts. Let's look at some code to understand what this means. Let's say that we have written a class that can help us fetch user profile data and return that information back. However, the basic user information is in a different database from the profile information, so we'll somehow need to merge those data. But not only that, before we return it, we'll have to remove all the address information to preserve user privacy. So let's start off by looking at a very basic implementation. We'll then improve that code step by step by identifying various issues in the code. All right, first, let's look at this basic implementation here. We have a user repository that has SQL client, Cosmos client, and a formatter. And the constructor takes in a formatter to kind of remove the addresses. And we have an initialization function that basically initializes the SQL client and Cosmos client. Um, the setup I have here is basically assuming that the user information, the core user information comes from SQL versus the profile data comes from Cosmos, all right? And then we have a get user method that basically takes in user ID, initializes the databases if they're not, and basically just fetches the user, fetches the profile, merges the data somehow, we don't really care for the merge logic, and then uses the formatter to kind of format um, the merged data, which basically somehow removes the address information. So this is a basic implementation. We don't really have to go into detail about how everything works exactly, but I wanted to point out some glaring issues in this code. I mean, this code would work, but um, one of the main problems here, if you look at the usage down here, is that when you create a new user repository, and just FYI, I'm using one in the class names because I have four or five different variants, so I just want to disambiguate them. But anyways, so when you create a new user repository, the person that is initializing this user repository doesn't really realize that there's a hidden dependency of a formatter here, right? Like we are initializing that somewhere inside the constructor, or even if it's in initialized somewhere inside get user, uh, it, it is a his hidden dependency. And why is that bad? Is because the user of this user repository has no clue that they actually need this formatter for this class to actually function. And that's actually a bad design. So how can we improve that? Let's fix that by going to the next step and refactor this code a little bit. All right, so we've improved it a little bit. One, we've created an interface just to make it more um, concrete in terms of its contract. So we have a I user repository and then a get user method, right? And the next thing we've done is we still need the SQL client, Cosmos client, and the formatter, but we have injected them as part of a constructor. And this is called const constructor injection, where the constructor clearly defines what um, classes or what dependencies it has. And the rest of it is pretty much the same as before. We have a get user, we basically get user profile, merge them, format them, and return it to the user, right? But the difference here now is if you look at the usage, Whenever the person using this repository is creating a new repository class, user repository over here, it's explicitly defined that we need a SQL client, we need a Cosmos client, and we need a formatter for this class to work. Sure, the user now has the responsibility of figuring out where you're gonna get all the information needed to actually initialize these dependencies, but we'll cover that in a bit, but um, at least, just by constructor injection, we have clear uh, contract that the user repository needs these three dependencies for, for it to work. So there's no such case where someone's going to use it and there will be a hidden dependency and you don't know what's going on, right? So at least this is way clearer. So then let's see if there's 
more issues with this code, right? It looks better than before, but what I'm kind of getting to here is I understand that we probably need the SQL client and Cosmos client for this to work, but do we really need the formatter as part of initializing this class? Maybe not, right? Like, okay, in this case, get user needs to use the formatter, but in the future, we may have, say, for example, <clears throat> set user, right? In that case, we may not need that formatter, right? Like, so does the formatter actually belong to the class or does it belong to this method, right? So that's the next question is when you do constructor injection, you have to kind of think about whether the class itself needs the object that you're injecting or is it just tied to a specific method. In our case, get user, when it returns the user profile, we expect the data or address data to be redacted. So um, we need the formatter for that, but we may not need it for any other method. So in this case, the formatter actually belongs to the get user class, in, uh, get user method instead of the class itself. So for the next step, let's improve that. And that's the next step in our refactoring. So now what we've done here is we have created almost like a overloaded method here. It's not exactly overloaded, but we have created two different methods over here. One is get user. So that just returns the full user, nothing gets redacted. And we have created a new get redacted user that actually expects a formatter as well so that it can use to redact that information, right? And then we have obviously dropped the formatter from the constructor, constructor dependency. So now we expect only SQL client and Cosmos client. That's what we initialize. And then in get user, we just fetch the user information um, over here, fetch the profile information, and then we simply merge that data and return it as is. But in the get redacted user, we actually expect the formatter. So you'll do the same thing um, and then return the formatted data um, as merged, right? Um, actually, I just realized that I don't, re I don't actually need to redo this. I could have just used this dot get user over here and then supplied the user ID and then call the formatter with that, right? Anyways, so that's a better step here. And in terms of usage, the person who's using this repository class is still responsible to figure out how to initialize these dependencies. But other than that, when you actually create the user rep repository, you just need these two. And if you ever need to use get user, you don't actually need the formatter, but if you want to use get redacted user, then you need to supply the user ID as well as the formatter, right? So this, this is a better organization and we have some boundaries set on who owns what or who needs what. This is more of a functional approach where you supply uh, everything the method of the class needs as a dependency for it to do its job. There's no hidden dependencies, whether it's a method or it's a class, right? But the problem that's happening right now is this class is kind of starting to turn into a God class. And if you don't know what God class means, you can check out my video on code smell. But the gist of it is that it's doing too many things and it's starting to violate the single responsibility principle. This class as is, is not that bad, but you can sense that it's starting to do a bunch of different things than what a basic user repository is supposed to do, right? Um, and you can imagine as you add more methods and more responsibility to this class, this can be very muddled and you don't have a clear boundary between what um, the user repository is supposed to do. So we can improve that by separating the responsibility, which is the S of solid design patterns, single responsibility principle, right? Uh, so let's split this into a couple of different interfaces and we'll extract out the formatter as well and then refactor this class to be a better designed um, system so that the benefit of that is you can isolate user repository, profile repository, formatter within themselves and test them uh, individually as well. The other benefit is, of course, like the formatter can now be reused in its own context. Profile repository can be used in its own context. So let's see how that looks. All right. So now what we have done is instead of creating I user repository or I profile repository of whatever like that, we've created a generic interface that's basically an I repository of an object T, right? And then we do get by ID and we just supply the ID and it returns that object. 
And then we did the same thing for informatter. It's an I formatter that expects to work on a specific object. And then we have a format and then we expect that object. We format it, we redact information, we do whatever we want. And then we'll basically return the object in a formatted or cleaned up manner, right? So now based on that, let's just zoom in a little bit. So based on that, now we have user repository that implements the I repository of a user, right? And then now, because user data is in SQL, we supply the SQL client as a constructor dependency. And for get by ID, it's pretty straightforward. We expect an ID and then we just fetch that user, send it back. So as you can see, user repository basically operates on the user. It needs the exact database that the user data is on. Doesn't do anything more, doesn't do anything it's less. It's got very limited work and it follows a very single um, responsibility pattern, right? Same thing with profile repository. It's an exact copy of the first one, I repository of profile. And the only difference is instead of SQL client, because our profile data is in a different database, in this case, we assume that it's Cosmos. We supply the Cosmos client, and then basically get by ID is almost exactly the same. Instead of fetching it from SQL, we fetch it from Cosmos, just return it. Again, simple, straightforward, nothing else to do. So if you think about testing this, how simple it is to just send mock objects here instead of like an actual Cosmos client. You can send a mock Cosmos client and just test that this um, method works properly, right? And then the same thing with address redactor, which basically cleans up the address information. We use iFormatter for profile because profile is the data structure that has the address information. And then we simply format that. I, I skipped the redaction logic here, but you get the idea and we format that. So we've got the basic implementations as well as the interfaces set up. So then now usage here is the person using it basically initializes the user repository, profile repository, and then address redactor. And then they basically use the user repository, fetch the user information, use the profile repository, fetch the profile information, and then use the um, um, your address redactor over here or the formatter to kind of clean up the data, merge the data. So you're delegating the responsibility up the chain to the user that's actually using these, um, these implementations here, but greatly simplifying the implementations. The benefit of that is now, now because these implementations themselves are so generic, a lot more use cases can come up. Like you could have, you could fetch this information somewhere else. Someone else can use this for different reasons. Someone else can use this for different reasons. And then they can do whatever business logic they want to do themselves, right? I wanted to talk briefly about this part of code over here. So the one thing about refactoring is it, it doesn't eliminate the need to create objects. Or when I say don't use new or don't use the new keyword or don't have hidden dependencies, just by the fact that we're removing the dependencies out and injecting them doesn't take care or doesn't completely eliminate need the need to create those objects. I mean, they need to be created somewhere, right? One way is to delegate the responsibility to the user of the classes or interfaces. In this case, that's what we're doing. But one way to even improve that is to design your project with a IOC container. And uh, containers are huge topics on their own, so I'll skip it for a different video. But basically, you have one configuration where you define uh, what all classes, what every interface is, what every inter implementation is, how you initialize them, what dependencies they need. So you basically build, a, when, you, when the project starts, it basically builds this graph of what it needs to create what object. So that's already there, right? Like, so when, whenever someone needs something, instead of them themselves trying to new the object, they basically use this IOC container to just resol resolve that uh, type of interface or object, right? So in this case, we need the user repository. So basically, I just use the IOC container dot resolve of type I repository and user, and the container will know how to fetch the actual user uh, repository implementation and give you that object, right? And with containers, you can define life cycles, right? Like whether you want the repository to always be singleton, or do you want to create a new connection every time someone fetches it? And it's usually very flexible. And depending on your project and use cases, you can set it up however. But anyways, Profile repository is the same. You just call the IOC container and then fetch that implementation. 
and then same with the address redactor. So now that way you've even removed the responsibility from the user of these um, implementations you have from having to new the dependencies, right? Like that's taken care of a centralized container. That way now this code is much cleaner. Uh, the responsibility for the user is kind of minimal. They know the contracts are pretty well defined, so they know exactly what they need, how they, how they should use it without even looking at any documentation. The classes themselves have been greatly simplified. So when you want to test it, uh, you can simply mock them and test them out very in a very isolated manner, right? And uh, the reason I title this video Hidden Dependencies is also because when you start refactoring, I mean, this is a very simple code, but if you think about a large code database or large class, uh, it can, if you're not used to it, it can get overwhelming to see, okay, where do I start refactoring? Where do I uh, begin, right? And sometimes you can get lost and start going down a rabbit hole. And usually based on my experience, I've always found that starting by eliminating hidden dependencies is a great place to kind of start your refactoring process. Because once you start eliminating that, you kind of improve the lowest level of your implementations or services. And then the responsibility goes or it gets delegated to a different level or maybe upstream or downstream. And then you kind of see that, oh, I need to refactor this to make this one better. And then it kind of cascades onto a larger refactoring effort. So I generally find that just eliminating or trying to eliminate hidden dependencies and trying to make the classes follow a single responsibility pattern is a great place to start. Um, improving your code and begin your refactoring process. Like with most other things related to coding, refactoring is also basically problem solving, which is a perfect segue to today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a problem solving website that provides interactive courses to teach you new ideas or to help you sharpen and refresh your existing knowledge on topics mainly related to math and science. The best way to learn anything is by doing it yourself. And Brilliant is an amazing tool for learning STEM topics interactively through their hands-on lessons with delightful animations. Interactive learning helps you learn things six times more effectively than just watching lectures. Learning on Brilliant is so engaging, it almost feels like playing a game. And in case you get stuck, you aren't penalized for it. Instead, they give you in-depth explanations to help you make meaningful progress. Even though I have a ton of experience in software engineering, I still use Brilliant to refresh my knowledge on specific math topics like probability and statistics, various search algorithms, as well as machine learning models like neural networks. I find that I not only enjoy the interactive lessons that Brilliant has, I also retain that information much better. So if you're as into improving your problem solving skills and learning new STEM concepts as I am, visit the link in the description below to get started for free. The first 200 of my subscribers to click the link will also receive 20% off their annual membership. So yeah, that's all I had for today. Uh, if you wanna learn more about code smells and how you can identify them, you can check this video out. Um, thanks for stopping by till the end. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.